everyone. Um, excuse the strange view you have at the moment. It will make sense in a moment. I wanted to do this um, video, <coughs> uh, so I thought it might interest some of the wargaming uh, uh, subscribers that I have. Um, talk a little bit about wargaming magazines. I, I currently subscribe to three wargaming magazines. Um, wargames Illustrated and Miniature Wargames. Um, which are both monthly magazines, and I get this one, War Games Soldiers and Strategy, uh, that comes out every two months. Um, it's quite a big financial commitment, really. They, they're, they're not cheap, and I usually renew my subscription every year. Um, I'd, I was thinking the other day, um, when some of these dropped through the door, that I, I don't really get value for money from them anymore, that that I I open them, I skim through the pages, um, my eyes are sort of drawn to some of the uh, the eye candy in here, you know, the, the colourful photographs and so on, and occasionally there'll be an article that I'll read, um, I, I, I enjoy them for news and updates on releases and products and new rule sets and new games that have come out. Um, but the vast bulk of these magazines never gets read by me. And um, the problem is I just can't, um, I can't drop them in case I miss something. Um, occasionally, for instance, in here, this, this is how I get to find out about things like you see there. There's a, an advertisement from a company that I really admire, Adrian's Walls, um, showing their new um, sort of Mesoamerican terrain, which is fantastic. Um, I'm almost tempted to buy it, even though I don't wargame that period, simply in order to start wargaming the period. Um, Banner of the Sun range, it's called, and uh, that that's the kind of reason I get that, but I've paid, uh, how much this magazine costs, £4.95, that's probably the only thing that drew my attention in this magazine this this month, um, but I ju as I say, I, I just cannot um, unsubscribe from these, I, I daren't. Um, and that's really a kind of reflection of my age, I think. I'm, I'm very much a kind of um, pre-internet kind of mentality about these things. I have to have a hard copy, um, even though I, th I believe you can probably buy all these three magazines in digital version now. And um, I wanted to show you... that. These these sort of take up a lot of space um, every kind of two months. Well, no, every month I get those, and every two months add add one of these to it. So it it rapidly takes up space, and I have been buying war game magazines um, right back to the early 1980s, and. Um, so on top of all my other problems, because I could keep them, I can't bear to get rid of them in case I um, lose something that I'll want to refer to years later. I've got a massive capacity problem now, and I've got piles of these magazines threatening to clap shelves or slide off over the top of surfaces and... and all kinds of things, um, not to mention, I don't know, they're probably a fire risk. <laughs> I've got masses of paper, combustible materials around everywhere. Um, and it's, it's just a big problem for me, a ma massive problem. So this, to give you an idea, this is just one cupboard out of many. Um, chock full see that, yep, chock full of old wargaming magazines. Um, these, are, This is the oldest uh, section and um, 
miniature war games I've got, as I got, as I said, I've got back to the 1984. I've got from issue 12. Um, it actually first came out in 1983, but I was out of the country um, that year, and uh, only only discovered miniature war gaming when I came back, and I was it was onto issue 12. Um, War Games Illustrated, more or less the same period. I think I've got from issue number three or four. And there's another section of magazines in there called Practical War Gaming. Um, but the the miniature war games uh, only goes up to in here, only goes up to about 2000. I think the War Games Illustrated goes up to about 2015. And there are no war game soldiers and strategies in here. They're all piled up uh, on top of other shelves and things. Um, why is it that I'm like that? Well, when you think about it, 19, the 1980s is long before the internet. And if you were to get rid of these magazines in those days, they were gone forever. Um, you never had a chance to go back to them and reread an article, and and I think that's one of the big changes that's happened with these magazines. That um, I can still recall, and I and I can probably find them with a very sort of brief search. Certain articles that I still think were valuable, um, in particular one by Rod Langton. Um, on painting and rigging one twelve hundredth um, age of sail models, um, model ships, and another one in miniature wargaming, which is about, I'm guessing about issue 55, somewhere in the 50s. Um, and we're now on to uh, 418. Um, but in the mid 50s, somewhere, there was two. Uh, part article on Abyssinian costumes and armies in the in the 1880s and 1890s, which uh, I wasn't into at the time of the magazine's release, but years later I started to get into that period, the Italian wars against uh, invasion of invasion of Abyssinia and the Battle of Adawa and so on, and I remembered the article and went back to it, and it was extremely valuable. But now, I, I do find the... It's not that the quality has deteriorated, but it's the it's the actual content, subject matter, that there are the, the, these are far more chatty now, um, more designed to kind of just entertain you, um, and then you can dispose of the magazine. You don't have to... You don't have to keep it like you used to. And of course, um, the other big problem is that um, when when you build up to this number of magazines, um, you, you really do need, need to have some kind of indexing system, and I haven't got that. So I don't think War Games Illustrated have ever brought out an index, nor War Games Soldiers and Strategy, but Miniature War Games did for the first time in issue 100, sort of on the, on the 100th uh, copy of the magazine, they put an index in of all the previous articles and then they updated that kind of on a, an annual basis for a few years, but that didn't last very long. So now, unless you actually um, tr trawl your way through all the pages of all these magazines, you're very unlikely to come across an article specifically related to something that you might be searching for. Um, so in a way, collecting them kind of defeats the object. But as I say, you can't, I just can't get rid of them because of that initial um, enjoyment that I used to get out of reading them. I used to read them from cover to cover, not like now where I might read one page. Um, but also, um, it, it, it's just it's just the, it's just the fear of losing those those occasional really 
uh, informative, really kind of entertaining um, and useful articles that are few and far between now. I'm afraid I find all these magazines um, full of colour and great to kind of casually skim through, but uh, there's not much there's not much in them for me now. But I don't think I'm ever going to be able to stop. So anyway, I'll, I'll stop waffling. What I wanted to do is I, th I thought it would be useful just for me to pick out some of the, the very old magazines from here and go through them in front of the camera just to give people an idea of what the wargaming hobby itself was like back in those days because it, it has changed so much to give you an idea of the products that were available um, and the the main areas of interest that wargamers had back in the in the early 80s so I'll just uh, change the camera angle and then uh, we'll go through some of those right here we go then so um, I haven't prepared any of this so um, anything could happen in the next half hour um, this is my earliest uh, copy of a miniature war games magazine it's issue number 12 and uh, can't see a date on it paper in here and what of ah yeah I know what that is um, I was talking earlier about indices and I've, I've put in the, here the um, the issues that had indices of the articles so up to um, issue number 192 it was possible to um, find an index of the articles but after that and for all the other magazines you're on your own I was looking for a date. Um, well, that's weird, isn't it? I honestly thought they put dates on them even back then. Um, sure, it was 1984 sometime. Anyway, I was um, I was living in Ramsgate at the time, and um, you have to kind of picture a, a world where it's quite hard to get a regular wargaming fix, as it were. There's no internet at all, nothing nothing like YouTube or um, uh, online um, entertainment for wargamers. Um, wargaming clubs are few and far between. I mean, back in the late 1970s, I'd been a member briefly of the South London war warlords um, when I lived in South London. But um, living in Ramsgate, there was nothing really, and I was very um, pleased to uh, observe a, 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 a wargaming shop open up in Broadstairs. Um, so uh, I got to know the guy that ran that, and we were beginning to form a little group of wargamers and play in one another's flats and so on. But um, I left that at just about the point where that uh, got going. Um, so really, your only exposure to the outside world, wargaming world, was via these magazines. Um, so I'm going to go through it page by page just to give you an idea. Um, a lot less colour in them in those days. Uh, so some very old... Um, companies and so on advertising in the mini figs were the far and away the biggest um, war game figures supplier in those days um, so there's an advert there um, for the, their 15 mil colonial figures um, games people play that was a shop I don't think that's still there um, Notting Hill Gate in in London at the sign of the red unicorn QT models uh, ah no QT models um, I don't believe they exist anymore but that was the name I was trying to remember for I did have some of their Mongol figures Gallia and Lamming Essex still going of course high standards standard games and publications so this is like um, board games playing aids from the war games research group they're still around, obviously. I, th I believe they are, anyway. 
Um, and then you get on to um, the contents. <clears throat> so in these days, Duncan McFarlane was the, the editor. Um, usual kind of thing, you get a, an editorial. Um, I'm not going to kind of read too much of it in silence in front of the camera. Um, but all the usual kind of thing. Uh, Zeug House, I can't remember who they were. Books for the Wargamer. I have a feeling Zeug House may have been a chap called Peter Hofstra, who used to be a member of the South London Warlords. Um, can't remember exactly. And then you get onto the the contents. Um, Ian Weekly, who's uh, deceased now, um, used to write articles for various magazines on how to build, build you know, various buildings and models and so on. He had his own company where he produced some of his buildings in a sort of uh, polystyrene kind of resin. I have some of those. So a simple article on how to make frame tents, which is still um, a topical thing to this day. An article on Mussolini's forces by someone called Chris Best. An advert for Battlements, which was Ian Weekly's company. Um, Tanga, 4th of November 1940, 1914 by Ian S. Dunbar, um, which is... A, a, the, these are more kind of... Um, they give you they give you the history of various battles and so on, and then tell you how to war game them and give you a bibliography. So, I I think um, the, the kind of quality of articles you get nowadays isn't quite up to this standard. Advert for games innovation integral terrain. Um, where's the evidence? Problems for the ancient war gamer by Ian C Drury. Um, here's the evidence the sharp end in AD 360 by Phil Barker I think he's the, uh, yeah, he's the um, writer of the DBM and all those rules isn't he? DBA and that kind of thing Fog oh no I don't think he wrote Fog but the, the famous Bark, Barker-esque language that he uses Use, uh, uses Umpiring Can Be Fun by Roy Beers, Time and Motion in War Games by Roy Beers. Um, you'll notice not a lot of um, colour, not a lot of photographs in those days. Um, Old Charlie, a game for would be Napoleonic staff by Graham Evans. Um, lots of thought gone into designing these games as well. Um, some adverts for body count, rules for platoon company level actions in Vietnam, an advert for the 1984 National War Games Championships to be held in the Great Hall Assembly Rooms at Derby um, on the 15th and 16th of September 1984, uh, using mainly War Games Research Group rules for the various periods, Newbury rules for Napoleonics and 19th century, Tercier for Renaissance, Lance for Medieval. Um, book reviews by Ian Knight. I think Ian, that must be the same Ian Knight who is the Zulu Wars uh, expert, I'm guessing. A couple of adverts for Corbus Miniatures and MN Castings. Um, Donington Miniatures. I think they're still going, but they're incorporated into another um, company now. This is the letters page called A Whiff of Grape Shot. Um, there's a letter here written by Guy Halsell of the University of York. Um, and he's responding to a letter by Paddy Griffiths in Miniature War Games. Here's a couple of colour pictures. Um, these are a Sudan game staged by Barry Edwards, figures from the collection of Barry Edwards. Uh, 
Steve's terrain. Steve Dunn lets us in on how and why he made his World War II micro terrain. Um, here's some of the pictures. So um, this is oh, these are pictures of Steve Dunn's micro terrain, and uh, this is Steve Dunn himself. Um, he must. He's probably if he's around now he's probably in his 60s I would guess by now probably about the same age as me um, during a game with John Plunkett and Tom Spinks uh, but there's a nice close up of the micro terrain there it was lovely lovely um, lovely terrain that he built uh, late medieval tactics for war gamers by RP Jenkins Pages are sticking together where they've been compressed so much. Um, oh, right, now here's a photograph, some more pictures by, um, uh, again, again, Barry Edwards figures, um, but I recognise a lot of these are Essex figures, and I'm sure these have probably been painted by Bill Brewer, I would imagine. Um, but es all Essex figures. Uh, Chris Best is besieged by standard games. Oh, I'm on this page here. Knock, knock, who's there besieging a castle? So, you see, this is what I mean about... Um, I, I, I was uh, looking at models of trebuchets and so on a while back and uh, completely forgotten. You do, you just have no recollection that there's articles like this available that you can look at. Um, a Battle for All Seasons by Don Featherstone. Now I think, um, did I say who the editor was of this magazine? Duncan McFarland. Yeah, Don Featherstone is the, um, the godfather of wargaming, obviously. Uh, and he's talking about the Battle of Oberosh in 1345. A couple of adverts for La Grenadier. Um, Fortress Models, Are You a Loser by Peter Tickler, um, an article written for that rare member of the Wargaming Fraternity, the general whose troops always seem to let him down. Uh, Warrior, now they're still going, they make very kind of cheap affordable figures but I'm sure they're still going, they're up in Glasgow. Um, classified ads. Uh, an advert for Paul and Theresa Bailey here. Yeah, they used to run a, they may still do on online, but they had a company called The Keep, uh, it's based in Devizes. Um, they don't visit shows anymore. I don't know if their, their business is still going. Irregular, still a long standing and still existing company. Jacobite Miniatures, don't remember them. Looks like they did medieval figures. Modern War Games Forum by Bruce Reed Taylor. Now I've got some rules by him. Um, so he's a he's a well established name. The Tin Soldier. I think they still exist as well. The Guard Room in Dunstable. Don't believe they they do. colour photo of some uh, African guerrilla warfare scenarios. This is probably by Bruce Reed Taylor, I would have thought. Heroic and Ross, they're still around aren't they? Hinchcliffe, Peter Lang, um, advert for the War Games Holiday Centre, um, which I think has been resurrected, and the Connoisseur range, Peter Gilder's range, Peter Gilder ran the War Games Holiday Centre. Conflict. I would think they've gone. They must be a shop in Stoke Newington. Not heard of them. And games, uh, which seem to have a variety of shops in Liverpool, Leeds, um, Liverpool and Leeds, uh, selling products such as Grenadier models. And on the back, you often used to get really lovely. Photographs. This is 
this is one, it's clearly not a war game, it's just a, uh, a sort of diorama that's been put together of a confederate raid on a, on a, a town with a lovely model train and railway station there and some union behind uh, the barricade trying to fend them off. Um, so that gives you an idea of what miniature war games was like way back in the day. Um, that's taken me nearly 14 minutes already. Um, so I better rush on. Uh, this is my earliest war games illustrated. This is number three, which was November 1987. Um, so they must have started sometime in 1987. Um, I'll just go through this very quickly because it You'll see, I think, straight away, that they began to rival miniature war games. The adverts are all very similar, but they they have always been s sort of one step ahead in terms of their photography. So you can see there's a lot more colour in there. There's an article on the uh, modern 1300 scale armour. Um, I say a lot more, but for the, by the today's standards, there's still very little. But there's there's colour on uh, probably every other page. Yeah, called by someone called Andrew Mulholland, um, Andy Callan, writing an article on War Games Battles of the Jacobite Rebellions. You see, it's all, it's all good reference material. This is what I'm saying about modern, the, 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 the current contemporary magazines, that there's, there's very little in them that I stop and read now. Uh, the Storming of Gasney by David Snowden. More colour photographs. Uh, Napoleonic, Age of Sail. Some lovely pictures. Skytrex models and so on, I think. Um, this is a, um, a sort of one of those, I uh, don't know what they're called, but the games where you make a choice and then lead you on to another, another um, paragraph. I forget what the, the technical word for those is, but it's a game set in the American Civil War called Sam's Night Out, a solo adventures for boys written and illustrated by Peter Dennis. Uh, it's hard to open some of these pages because they've been compressed together for so long. Lots of adverts. And then some picture reviews at the end, so some lovely Pictures of Dixon Samurai, uh, Skytrex ship, uh, Hotspur figures, and Essex, the Essex Napoleonics. Um, and then on the back page, again, some pictures. So the photography is definitely superior to miniature war games, and always has been, as one improves, the other kind of leapfrogs it. And War Games Illustrated have always had the uh, upper hand in terms of eye candy. Um, what War Games Illustrated did as well, I'll show you these, I got out, is they always used to have kind of, or, the, or when they first started off, they, they used to have some special issues. I think they had about five. I've got, I've got four of them. So this is a, a magazine called War Games World which is War Games Illustrated first birthday special and they kind of pulled out all the stops with these magazines and had a lot, had even more colour and um, some, some really interesting articles and these were definitely worth keeping. Um, I'm trying to look uh, for one article in particular, just past there. The Spirit Games um, at one time used to have a shop in Croydon as well, and uh, it's where my parents live. So whenever I went back to visit my parents, 
I would nip in Spirit Games, but they closed the Croydon shop down, and they may still, the shop in Burton on Trent may still actually exist. Um, yeah, but there was a fantastic article. Oh, yeah, here it is, in this very first one, page eight, right at the start, um, on how to war game the Battle of Antietam. And um, there's a kind of grid map here, and it's not massive. I think each each square is only about a foot. So one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So a nine foot by six table, that's doable, isn't it? With how to put the terrain, and it's the entire battle. Um, not just one section of it, because the Antietam is sort of split into three component parts, really. There's a sort of Dunker Church, and then there's the uh, Sunken Road, and then Burnside's Bridge. But it's all on here. Um, and I always sort of had the aspiration of, of recreating this, um, and never got round to it. But it's always in the back of my mind somewhere um, that this... This map and article is is here. It was written by someone called, called Paul Carson, um, and gives you special rules for the battle, the orders of battle, and so on. Really, really kind of memorable article. Um, so that was their birthday special. Then they had a Christmas special. Uh, they had a spring special, and they had just another issue. And then I think they had a fifth one that I missed because um, I didn't subscribe in those days. I just used to go into the news agents every every month and pick these up. So there were things that you could miss. Um, anyway, that's War Games World, which was the special issues of War Games Illustrated. Um, I just I just got these out as well just to show you. These are mid nineteen nineties. Um, sort of magazines that uh, used to be able to pick up in Smiths. So I used to get these sometimes backwards and forwards on my train journeys. Um, so there's one called Military History and another one called Battlefields. Oh yeah, this was a, this was Volume One, Issue One. Um, so how long they survive for? I don't know. It's the only one I've got. But they covered Chancellorsville. Um, Article called Sport of Kings, 1735, English Civil War Battle Plans and Carousel, 1540. And uh, this grabbed my attention when I was in, probably at Paddington, waiting for a train. Um, so I got this. And then the other one I wanted to talk about was um, 1987. This is the first copy of a magazine called Practical Wargamer, which was of an extremely high standard um, in terms of the articles written and the people who were writing them. Um, its editor was Stuart Asquith, and um, a really good, absorbing read. I'm not sure if it was every other month. I think I'm not sure if it was bi-monthly or monthly. But some really um, informed, well-written articles in, in this magazine. But I, d I don't think it, there was any colour whatsoever. Colour in here was very sparse. Colonial Rules, uh, written by Ted Herbert. But a really well-presented magazine. Um, there's a model gateway, Roman gateway. Oh, there's some colour. The model castle someone's built. Um, article on the Franco-Prussian War. Fast becoming very popular amongst war gamers. A little bit of colour photography there. Article on the American Civil War. Ah, oh, this was a good article. It was painting the model horse. Um, so this is in the very first one, and this is still an issue today. Um, I know the Lockie, Lockie's great hall. If you're watching, 
you've done a whole series on how to paint horses, um, but this gives you a kind of step-by-step -step colour guide uh, to, to how to do various horse shades and so on that um, at the time I referred to a lot. I found it very useful. Um, who wrote this? Written by Graham Dixie. Napoleonic Wars India. Charles Grant writing about for a mini campaign for the bank play during bank holiday weekend. Raid on Vesta. Uh, can't make out what period it is. Eh? Looks like 18th century. His adventures with the Verenicht Freistadt and the Grand Duchy of Lorraine. So it might even be Imaginations. War Chariots of the Middle East, their history and use in war games described by Terry Wise. Terry Wise used to be another prominent war gamer. Um, I've got some American Civil War rules by him, I believe. Lord of the Rings, Tolkien action, the Battle of Bywater. Computers. <laughs> so this is the early, early days of um, of computing in wargaming. Many wargamers dismiss the micro out of hand, but they can be fun. So this is wargaming. Look at the standard of of. Um, the games they had in those days. So it's, t it's, t it's talking about the early days of uh, wargaming on a computer. An article on uh, the Battle of the Falklands, the naval battle in 1914. Uh, British reconnaissance units in World War II by Mike Taylor. Far more depth in them. Far more depth and far more detail. And then we're on to the adverts. And this magazine, as I say, um, it never really got a toehold. Um, miniature war games and war games illustrated was, were all were kind of out out uh, outshone them in a way. Um, but I think the actual content in this magazine, I've got every single one of those because sadly. They went up until, I believe this is the last one, um, which is uh, Practical Wargamer, November, no, sorry, December to February 1999, volume 12. Oh, yeah, they used to have volumes, that's right, each, each oh, I can't remember, they, I think they had volumes and then issues within the volume. And this is the last one, you can see... Still very little colour, very little um, in the way of uh, of eye, things to attract the eye, but the articles are still very well, well written. Um, and I think, yeah, Stuart Askus was still the editor back, so he was the editor right the way through. But it just seemed to stop, and um, that was a shame. But I used to really like Practical War Gamer. Anyway, that gives you... Very kind of, uh, not brief, I've gone on for nearly half an hour, just on this section alone. But that gives you an idea of what wargaming was like in, in those days and what you had um, available. Hope you enjoyed. Thanks very much for watching. Bye for now.